Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 130, The Search for Richard III, a conversation with Matthew Morris. For today's guest episode, Matthew Morris kindly agreed to talk to me about the archaeological dig that resulted in the discovery of the final remains of Richard III, which serves as a prelude to the next episode, which will be about Shakespeare's take on the final Yorkist king. Towards the end of our conversation, we spoke about those differences between the Richard of the play and what the skeletal remains that have been uncovered tell us about the real-life king. But most of the conversation is about how the remains were discovered, how they were then recovered for analysis, and how they were proved to be the remains of Richard III. Matthew Morris is a project officer at the University of Leicester Archaeological Service with over a decade of archaeological experience, having excavated a wide range of rural and urban archaeological sites across the Midlands, from the prehistoric period through to the Second World War. His specialisms include urban archaeology, community archaeology and Roman and medieval archaeology. Matthew graduated from the University of Leicester in 2003 with a BA in Archaeology and an MA in Landscape Studies, joining the University Archaeological Service in 2004. Notable projects include a massive multi-period urban excavation at High Cross in Leicester that included excavation of Roman townhouses, commercial buildings, two lost medieval churches and medieval cemeteries, and a Roman cemetery at Western Road in Leicester. And of course, in 2012, he directed the successful archaeological search for the lost grave of King Richard III. Recently, he's been digging up more Roman buildings and mosaics in Leicester, at the former Southgate's bus depot and All Saints brewery sites, and is currently leading the archaeological work for the Leicester Cathedral Revealed project. He's also co-authored the most comprehensive book ever written on the archaeology of Leicester, Life in Roman and Medieval Leicester, and three popular archaeology books, Visions of Ancient Leicester, Richard III, The King Under the Car Park, and Roman Leicester, Life in the Roman World. He is actively involved in promoting archaeology to the general public, regularly providing talks to local societies. He's also a committee member of the Leicestershire Field Workers and a branch leader of the Leicestershire Young Archaeologists Club. He currently leads the Castle Hill Community Archaeology Dig and the Bosworth Lynx Community Dig. Now clearly Matthew is a very busy man so I was really pleased to get to talk to him over Zoom from his home in Leicester. So I thought I might start with asking you something about what the history of the search for Richard III was that led to the your involvement in the project that was ultimately successful in finding his remains. It's a thing that's been in the air for a long time, I think. In some ways, it's been in the air for centuries in that people have been interested in what happened to Richard III since his tomb disappeared during the dissolution. But in terms of the actual discovery of Richard III, yes, it was, it was an idea that Philippa Langley came up with in the early 2000s, really after a publication by a historian called John Ashdown Hill that had identified um, DNA from uh, one of Richard's sisters, which would could uh, uh, a direct female relative of Rich, one of female line relative of one of Richard's sisters that could be used to actually potentially identify Richard the Third if skeletal remains were found. And until mm. that point, there was perhaps no point looking for him because there was no way you could easily prove it was him. But that sort of was the last bit of information that dropped into place. But then from having an idea to actually having something happening in reality obviously takes a long time to get off the ground. And right. for Philippa, it's sort of from the early 2000s until 2011, really, when it starts becoming reality. And that's when she starts talking to my boss at the time, Richard Buckley at the University of Leicester. He's now retired. And actually then it's sort of, you know, there was sort of good archaeological reasons to to carry out the project. And actually it was it was perfectly plausible that it could be successful, that the science was in place to actually make it possible. And so then it sort of starts sort of rapidly escalating. But even in 2011, there was bumps in the road that at times made it look like it might not happen, uh, funding issues and, and all sorts of things. 
So presumably there was some idea about where his remains might be. Well, that was the next big mystery. I mean, of course, there's there was various things we needed to achieve with any likelihood of success with Richard III. I mean, one was being able to identify him, and so the DNA um, line there that that really started answering that question. The next was the tricky story that Richard III might not actually be buried in Leicester anymore, and so. There is a story that gets published in 1611 by John Speed that tells this tale of the townsfolk digging up Richard's body during the dissolution and casting it off the local bridge into the River Saw. Yeah, nice. And that story then gets exaggerated and exaggerated and embellished as, as future writers add their own takes to it. And by the 19th century, it was widely believed that that was the truth. I mean, so much so that a local builder erects a plaque next to the bridge saying, near this spot lies the remains of Richard III. So there was always an, every history book right up to, and actually a few that came out just after the discovery, all ended with Richard III dug up and thrown in the river. So, so of course, that means then that there is this doubt. Yeah. But when you start boiling the evidence down for that it seems unlikely it's a story that gets published nationally by a man who possibly never visited leicester 70 years after it was supposed to have happened and in that sort of gap no one in leicester seems to have any knowledge of these events so it's either some mm -hmm. sort of conspiracy of silence in the entire town or it, it didn't happen and there's other evidence from locals uh, the man who owned the site uh, robert herrick had erected a, a pillar in his garden commemorating Richard and seeming to imply that Richard was still buried under his, his garden. So odds were the grave had not been desecrated during the desolation. But of course, that's 500 years ago. So there's a good chance, given the site's built on, that something had accidentally destroyed the grave as well. Yes. So big ask whether Richard was still buried in the ground. And then, of course, the final problem is we've lost the church he was buried in as well. So we've not just lost the king, but we've lost the church. And Richard III is not unique in England. He's not the only king of England missing. Stephen, Henry I, neither of those have known graves either. But at least with those monarchs, we do have an idea where the church was. It still stands as a ruin to some extent. Whereas in Leicester, all evidence of the church has completely disappeared. Which means whilst we've got a good idea of where the friary site is, and, and we've never really lost the friary site as in the whole precinct where the individual buildings are in the site that was a big mystery and most of that site is built on to go today i think it calculates as 83 percent of the site is inaccessible because of modern buildings on it wow okay so this was a very lucky in some respects but just to be clear there so so we had documentary evidence about where he was buried but we within the within a friary but not the exact location within that area so we have we have one I mean in general contemporary sources accounting for Richard's burial all agree he was buried in the Grey Friars. That was in Leicester. That was never a doubt, the, the no. Francisco Friary. There's only one source, John Rouse, that actually specifies which area of the church he's buried in. So he, he tells us he's buried in the choir of the church. Yeah. That's still quite a large space though. So I mean yeah. we've got sources that I mean it's a brilliant historic clue. We've got sources that effectively confirm Leicester within England, a specific church within Leicester, and then a specific area of the church. But that area is still the size of a building, effectively, the, the choir. So it narrows the data set down, makes it, um, you could do an archaeological search looking for the choir. It makes it something that you could perhaps find. But you're still going to have 30, 40 burials, maybe more within that area of the church, oh, of course, depending yeah. on how many people have been buried there. And you've still got to then identify one of them as mm -hmm. Richard III. So even then, it's still a long shot, a, a really hard job to successfully identify someone. So how was that narrowed down? Well, as it happens, it was the very first burial we found. So in some ways, we didn't have to narrow the search <laughs> down. But it was Luck a, was it, definitely on your side there. Luck was really on our side for this one. But effectively, I mean, we had a very limited window into the site that we could investigate anyway because of that, so much of it being built on today. And the resources we had, the financial resources, limited it even further. I sure. mean, there was only so much you can do with um, 
a two-week excavation, which was all it was, um, or was designed to be. It ran for three weeks ultimately, but it was only meant to be a short investigation. So you go into the site thinking, well, where do we start? We've got no idea where the buildings are. So that really, the first thing all you can do is actually just dig some holes and see what you mm -hmm. find. And our strategy was we'd dig two long trenches across the sort of the central car park, the social services car park in Leicester. And it was the staff car park for Leicester City Council. And based on the results from those two trenches, we would then be able to start putting in more targeted trenching, hopefully with the idea of narrowing the search down Mm -hmm. from the entire friary to a specific part of it and then hopefully be able to find the church and the choir itself and and that was effectively what the project did the first two trenches identified the chapter house of the friary the eastern cloistral range and allowed us to put a third trench in that identified the church itself and and crucially the east end of the choir of the church but by then we'd actually unknowingly already found richard the third because he was literally the very first archaeological discovery of the project on the very first day, within six hours, we'd found a grave. I mean, for and an that archaeologist, grave, that has got to be a once-in-a-lifetime event, I assume. <laughs> I would guess so. I mean, at the time, we just knew it was a grave, and that was good news in that it was we were in the right area. We were, we were definitely finding evidence of the friary, but at the time, it looked like it was more likely to be external in the graveyard. And without knowing exactly where it was located in relation to the church, we didn't want to disturb it. Um, it then takes a week, another week of, of investigation of the trenches to actually identify that that grave we found on the first day is in the right area of the church. Mm. And then we excavate it. And yes, it's it's looking very good that it's going to be Richard III at the time. And, and this is just a skeleton uh, that you came across as you dug down, and it's basically lying there in a hole that you've made. Yeah, so the remains are completely skeletal. They are in a an earth grave underneath what would have been the floor of the choir so whoever buried richard the third they've broken through the floor lifted that out dug a grave underneath it placed the body in the grave filled it in and we don't know then what was initially placed back over it although we know 10 years after richard's death an elaborate tomb was erected over the grave and um, there's historical records of that being commissioned in 1494 so exactly 10 years later but we would presume it's either a, from evidence we've got elsewhere in the friary it looks like the floor tiles on other burials were lifted up the grave was installed the burial took place and then the floor was reinstated over the top so we'd sort of presume that perhaps the same thing initially happened here so a very shallow grave no evidence of a coffin in it no evidence of clothing or anything else like that so very um, a very simple burial, uh, a very sort of hasty burial in many respects, or a burial, as we don't know the thought processes of the people who buried Richard III, the, the best way to describe it is the burial is minim showing minimal reverence, right. because archaeology can't answer why there's that minimal reverence. <laughs> of course, yeah. Uh, whether it was just because they didn't know how to dig a grave, they were in a hurry, they didn't like who they were burying, we don't know any of that. Um, but yeah, very simple and atypical for the friary. Where we've excavated other burials in the friary, they are more typical for what we'd expect in that area of the church. They are all in large, neatly dug graves. They've all got coffins in them, at least wooden coffins. One's even in a stone sarcophagus. So they are much more elaborate burials than that we see with Richard's burial. In some ways, it's, it's an odd one because Leicester, in theory, shouldn't be a Yorkist heartland, even though he was born in Fothering, hey, in, in Northamptonshire and not too far away. Yeah, right. Leicestershire is actually La Lancastrian heartland. Mm. Leicester itself is the, really the capital of the Lancastrian dynasty, Leicester Castle. Um, the, uh, the church in the Newark, the collegiate church, was founded um, by the Dukes of Lancaster as a mausoleum for the the Lancastrian family. Yet during the Wars of the Roses, whilst the rest of the county is pretty ardently Lancastrian, Leicester sides with York at the very beginning of the, the conflict and stays supporting York all the way through in complete opposition to what their actual overlord in theory is, which is the the Lancastrian King of England at that mm -hmm. point. So it's a, it's a really weird quirk of fate. And actually, then Richard the Third, well, Edward the Fourth first, and then Richard the Third gives honours to Leicester and grants that 
you see in other towns in Britain, but they often disappear or get pulled back later on, whereas Richard and he constantly honours Leicester, it seems like. So there was obviously some sort of special connection there or something just because they were so atypical in their support um, that they kept on mm. being supported by the House of York. But yeah, it's a, it's a weird one, that, because Leicester should not have supported York at all. They should have been totally Lancastrian, but weren't. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so the next step was to to remove the skeleton, uh, obviously very carefully. Uh, presumably, it's pretty fragile. It's actually it's surprisingly. I mean, it's it's pretty robust. Actually, it's um, skeletal remains survive really well in Leicester's soils. They're quite free draining, not too acidic, and so I mean, actually, you can get Roman burials a thousand years further back than Richard mm. the Third that are in as good condition as Richard the right. Third's remains as well. So. So bone survives really well, but organic materials, fabric, cloth, things like that, they don't survive. Um, Leather, wood, wouldn't survive in Leicester's soils at all. So, yeah, there's a a process with excavating human remains. You can't just dig them up. Once you've identified you've got them and you know that you are going to want to exhume them, you've got to apply for a license from the Ministry of Justice. So it's actually illegal to exhume human remains in, in England. Uh, the Burial Act of 1857 lays out the, the law for examination. You have to get a license. So even, so even the remains step, that, that are that old? you, you still, Even for any human remains, any. it doesn't matter what age they are, you have to have a license from the Ministry of Justice. Mm. And that's a fairly standard form for archaeological work because it is archaeological work and the remains are so old. But it's the same process as if it's a modern case as well. Right. So... Once we we know we've had that skeleton from the very first day, but it takes a week to know that it's in an area that we want to investigate, at which point we apply for the licence from the Ministry of Justice. And as soon as that comes through, we put in the plan to actually excavate the burial. So this takes place at sort of the beginning of the second week of the excavation on site. Um, the, the next issue we have is also we've only got from the sort of knees down in the trench itself. Uh, so we've got to widen. The trench we've got to get the digger back in we've got to cut a, an extra section out the tarmac in the car park and actually widen the trench in that area to to be able to actually get the full grave within the excavation area um and then once all of that's done we've then got to actually start uncovering the skeleton itself once it's uncovered it needs to be fully recorded photographed in the ground before it's lifted out and all of that was carried out by my colleague joe appleby our project osteologist for this um, and of course, all of this is going on whilst it's being filmed for Channel Four and uh, and so forth, which which adds an extra level of complication to it because obviously you've got to film stuff for a documentary as well as actually your day job. So so that slows things down. I think it takes us twelve hours to excavate the skeleton. Um, Joe starts eight o'clock in the morning on that day, and we don't leave site until the sun's going down around about eight o'clock that evening. I certainly Mm. remember the sun was going down. It might have been longer than 12 hours. It was a long day. And mostly that was because of the extra bits of filming we were needing to do. Mm. So Joe excavates it. It's a warm day. It's early September, but it's still really warm at this point. She's wearing a full hazard suit, the sort of CSI (laughs) suit you see on on TV, because we can't risk contaminating any of the skeleton, DNA contaminating the skeleton. Um, so she's yeah full mask gloves white hazard suit and stuff excavating it that takes like 20 minutes to put on so she's not really moving around much either so i'm she's sort of in the hole i'm up top sort of trying to pass things down to her to allow her to sort of not really have to move around too much um and by the end of the day we have the skeleton fully excavated we don't want to leave it exposed on site at the end overnight so it's another reason to um, lift the skeleton all in one day and then we've got to get up to the university and we've got to get the bits that we're going to sample for DNA in the fridge as well to make sure that the DNA doesn't degrade any more than it already has. The DNA starts degrading quickly once it gets exposed to the air. Right? It's, it's not so much it's necessarily going to degrade any more quickly than it was. I mean, it's already going to be pretty degraded after 500 years, but it's, yeah. also, it's just there's so many potentials once it's exposed to contaminate it with modern DNA. And given it's so many tiny little fragments of DNA, because it started to break down, modern DNA can really overwhelm it effectively, that contamination. 
So getting it into a sort of sterile fridge as quickly as possible is, yes, it will, it will make sure there isn't any further degrading yeah. of the DNA if that is occurring, but it also sort of will hopefully shield it as well. So, And at this point, did you have any hint that, that it was the skeleton of Richard? Yeah, I don't think any of us left site that day thinking we hadn't found Richard III. It was oh, no. pretty, pretty compelling, at least circumstantially, when we were looking at the skeleton. So... But it was a fairly late realisation. It was, we'd spent all day with the skeleton, really. So the way you excavate a skeleton generally, or the easiest way, is you start what start from the outside and work in. So you sort of start with the head, the arms, the legs, the bigger, more robust bones. And then you move into the torso area and do sort of the fingers, hands, ribs, vertebrae last, the sort of the smaller, more fragile bones, um, so that they're not being disturbed until the very last minute to keep them all as intact as possible. So we'd spent all day with the skeleton, carefully un- uncovering it. Joe had sort of worked all the way around it, exposed the head. We'd seen an injury on the top of the head fairly early on. Um, she was starting to get a sort of feel that it was probably a male individual as well. But it's not that unusual. You know, it's a friary church. It's um, You'd expect male burials in it. and medieval england is as violent as any other period you do find people which show signs of injuries and they don't have to be kings that have died in battle so so yes it was looking like it was going to be a really interesting skeleton but i don't think we were really thinking it was richard the third and it it just seemed so improbable anyway that we were going to be successful i mean projects don't work like this it's (laughs) they're not this successful all in one go so we'd not really, you know, it was sort of the vibe was more, it was, oh, it's going to be a friar that's had a really bad Friday night sort of feeling, you know, it was that sort of, it didn't seem like it was Richard III. And then Joe uncovers the vertebrae. Um, and that's sort of when the, the penny drops. It's, so she'd already uncovered the, the vertebrae at the neck, the spine coming out of, of, of the skull itself and had got the spine coming up from the pelvis. And she was just sort of filling in the gap in the middle bit when the vertebrae seemed to disappear. And we were thinking, oh, perhaps they've just disintegrated fully in that area. Maybe it was just a bit wetter in the grave at that point and they've disintegrated. And then she finds them. And of course, they're curving off with that famous photograph now, if you look at it in yeah. the ground, with that that epic curve of, of the spine, sort of almost kinking 90 degrees out and curving back round again. And it's that point where you're looking in the ground and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute. At that point, we now know this is a burial within the choir of the church. We know it looks like it's a young male adult. We know it's got a head injury and it's now got a hunchback for want of a a word at this particular (laughs) point. Um, This is going to be Richard III. The coincidences here are so They're stacking up. It's it's got to be. (laughs) um, Of course, Knowing it's Richard the Third and proving it's Richard the Third, they're two entirely different issues. But I don't think any of us left that day thinking we hadn't found it. Mm. But the focus had been so tight on getting the job done properly and respectfully for the for the human remains uh, that I don't think any of us had time to process that significance. I mean, I certainly didn't. I, it wasn't really until I was driving home that evening afterwards um, that it slowly started to dawn on me that actually against all odds we probably actually succeeded in what we'd been telling everybody it was a really long shot and there it was was straight away so the skeleton waited for you overnight um in the lab nice nice and protected and safe um and then the identification piece comes next i guess yes it's um some little bits obviously um the next day there's quite a stir amongst the team who a lot of them have missed it because they'd gone home at a normal time not Mm. stayed an excessively long time overnight. Obviously, there's this realization now that we've got a skeleton that we we definitely need to identify very thoroughly because it looks like this is probably going to be Richard the Third. So the excavation is still going on at this point, of course, and 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 then in the w- third week we announced to the world at an initial press conference that we found a skeleton that we think probably is going to be Richard the Third, and then of course that then triggers five months of scientific analysis to actually make that identification probable, which then culminates with a press conference in February 2013, where we're announced to the world that it's beyond reasonable doubt that it's Richard III. So that is a that is a 
big task, much bigger than the excavation in many respects, the, the scientific analysis, involving hundreds of people from across institutions across Britain and on the continent as well in France. University in, in Toulouse was involved with the DNA, University of York, Glasgow University, Oxford University. It was a big collaborative partnership between many individuals to make this possible. And so we've got things like we've got the osteological analysis of the skeleton itself. We've got the forensic analysis of the injuries. We've got stable isotope analysis of the bones to look at the mineral content of the bones, to look at things like diet, geographical movement of the individual during their lifetime. We've got the DNA analysis, obviously. We've got radiocarbon dating. And all of that's got to then come together to make a unique identification. So identifying human remains as a specific individual, whether it's a recent case or an historic case, is really difficult. Skeletons give you a lot of information, but it's quite broad what you can get about a person from, from their bones. But you'd hope with the right combination of archaeological evidence, forensic evidence and historical evidence, when you're trying to make a unique identification, that there's enough overlap there to make it only possible that it's one individual. Yeah. But that gets harder the further back in history you go because there's less of certain of those categories, particularly historic evidence, for instance. You okay. lack the biography of people as you go further back. Mm. So it gets really difficult. Fortunately, though, Richard III is the king of England, so a lot of people wrote stuff about him when he yeah. was alive. I can see how that makes the life a, a bit easier anyway. And, and obviously you reached that point where it was unequivocally the skeleton of, of Richard III. Yeah, that absolutely. A combination of all of those factors you just detailed. Yeah, so obviously from the, the physical evidence of the skeleton, we can tell it's a, um, a male adult in his early 30s. Uh, we can see that this individual has died very violently. There's 11 sharp force traumas to the skeleton. Um, that have all been caused around about the time of death. We can see that the individual has scoliosis, so our sort of initial sort of impression of a hunchback, then with identification, we identify as scoliosis that the individual has. We can then start looking at that physical information and comparing it with the historical accounts, the eyewitness accounts of Richard and what he looked like. DNA then, obviously, it matches two known relatives of Richard III descended from his older sister, Anne of York. So all of this evidence then starts coming together very neatly. Radiocarbon dating confirms broadly that this is a person who died in the right period of history. And it is, it gets to that point where when you start bringing it all together, it creates such a unique picture. It can't be anyone else. Mm. I think they calculated it, if I remember correctly, as 99.9999% certain at its most conservative so, so so we're pretty confident we'll, we'll take that yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely so that's great so we 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 know all of that uh channel four get their uh, documentary probably a, a, even you know more detailed than they thought they were going to get and uh, a good in result fact, from they, it. yeah in fact they got three documentaries out of it at the minute in the end and i think they've all proved to be their most successful documentaries in their entire history so it just shows the interest in it Absolutely. And, and of course, a lot of that interest is, is generated through Shakespeare's play, which gives us a very uh, non-historical view of Richard, uh, particularly his, his character, we're, we're guessing. Uh, so from your point of view, from the point of view of the excavation, what do you think that tells us about the Richard in real life versus Shakespeare's vers version? I mean, actually, I think it's fair to say it's only because of Shakespeare that the project captured the world's imagination. Mm. I can't imagine people really getting into the story if it didn't have that instant recognition because of Shakespeare's play. And we see that with a more recent search for Henry I has not generated nearly as much interest. So uh, he hasn't got a Shakespeare play after him after all. So, so, no. so yeah, so I definitely, I mean, despite obviously Shakespeare's portrayal of Richard III as that sort of dastardly villain, it definitely provides the recognition that really captured people's imagination mm. and actually then of course when you've got the real individual finally you've got a really fascinating way of re-examining that play and all the things that anyone has written about richard the third because once you've got the physical remains you can see very clearly 
what is true and what isn't in those descriptions. So it gives you a really fascinating insight into how the Tudors sort of blackened Richard III through their, the propaganda of the various writers who wrote about him. I mean, a really good example of it is, so you've got various people, you've got two people that described Richard III for, who knew him from his lifetime. A knight called Nicholas von Popelau, writing in 1484, and he says, broadly, he describes Richard as lightly built with slender arms and thighs, which is very characteristic of the skeleton. The skeleton is only ever so slightly above average height and is very gracile for a male individual. So a very slender average height individual. And then you've got John Rouse who writes that Richard is small of stature with a short face and unequal shoulders, the right higher and the left lower. Now, Rouse was not particularly friendly to Richard III in, in after his death. He is a relatively hostile writer, yet his description is bland enough that it sort of feels like it's a, a real description of a real person. But then you look at Thomas More, who basically is using Rouse as his source of information, writing in 1513. And of course, Thomas More was one of the big sources for Shakespeare. Yeah. And you, you can really see how that by just changing the words, they're really starting to change the impression you get. So whereas Rouse says he's small of stature, Thomas More says he's little of stature, mm -hmm. which is instantly more demeaning. Yes. And of course, he then goes on to say he's ill-featured of limbs, crook-backed, his left shoulder much higher than his right, and a hard-favoured in appearance. So he's instantly starting to use words that are actually more demeaning and more blackening. And Polydor Virgil, writing a bit later, does basically the same thing. Again, he's using a bit of more and a bit of rouse, and he talks about him as being little of stature, deformed of body, a short and sour, sour countenance instead of just having a short face you know so you can really see them going to town here by subtly changing what people perhaps knew to be true and using very carefully selecting words they are starting to then change perception of him and of course that then becomes that sort of big source for shakespeare so things like shakespeare's withered arms mm. his limp his hunchback all of those things actually i mean the the most graphic description comes from henry the sixth part three where uh, Richard III goes to shrink mine arm up like a withered shrub to make an envious mountain on my back west. It's deformity to mock my body, to shape my legs of an unequal size, to disproportion me in every part. So that's the most explicit he ever gets. But actually, you can instantly see that's how uh, Richard III is always portrayed, even in the, in the later play of Richard III, where he's not as explicit when he describes himself. But then, of course, still goes deformed, unfinished, etc so you get this physical manifestation that shakespeare is creating of a very compelling character that has elements of truth to it and then elements tacked on that are completely made up so the archaeology now tells us there is no withered arm both arms are equal and they're proportional to the body and whilst we haven't got the feet they were missing um, from later disturbance we've got the pelvis so we can see that there is no abnormal wear on one side or the other so we know that um richard iii never walked with a limp either yeah so some things in shakespeare's portrayals are completely made up mm. but there underneath it there is this kernel of truth within this back deformity that when you look at john rouse back in sort of writing just after richard's death he's just talking about unequal shoulders that is completely typical of scoliosis and is completely consistent with the type of scoliosis richard has would have probably put his right shoulder so slightly higher than his left essentially the way the um the spine is sort of twisting slide sideways slightly thomas moore then mixes it up and he gets the, the unequal shoulders the wrong way round virgil is not consistent with it but again they're still talking about unequal shoulders but then shakespeare runs with that and exaggerates it even further to create this crooked backed or bunch-backed toad, as he gets called in, in the play, mm. which is really now exaggerating something that from scoliosis into something slightly different. So when we talk about hunchback individuals as a sort of non-medical term, we tend to be talking about people with kyphosis, um, which is um, a forward curve of the spine, effectively, that creates a hunched back, whereas scoliosis would not do that at all. In fact, as Richard stood up, 
in a sort of relaxed position upright. He would have no evidence, maybe on slightly unequal shoulders, of having an issue with his spine. But what would have then happened is when Richard bent forward to, say, pick something up off the floor, for instance, that act of bending forward, the way that the scoliosis sort of is like a corkscrew twist, what it would happen is as he leant forward, one shoulder blade would stick out more than the other. Mm -hmm. just because of the way that the vertebrae are are twisting and so would give the illusion of a hunch which would disappear as soon as he straightened back up again and most people are probably unaware of that but perhaps at the very end what we know is after richard's death his body is found stripped and looted on the battlefield and it's brought back to leicester and most accounts suggest it's either naked or near naked when it's brought back over a horse and the act of draping the body over the horse is the same as picking something up off the ground. That that forward would have actually pushed perhaps one shoulder blade out a bit more than another. And people would have seen it. Right. And it sticks in people's minds. Yeah. So now you've got this little element of truth circulating around that the Tudors can run with and start exaggerating even more. And of course, Shakespeare takes it to the ultimate conclusion, really. But of course, he's really com- he's creating a play. He's creating a character. So of course, he's... Yes. He's also exaggerating things as well, uh, not necessarily to blacken Richard's name, but to just create a very compelling character. Yes, quite. Although blackening his name didn't do any harm for Shakespeare. In well, the absolutely, Tudor context. of course. Yeah. And, I mean, he is, he is operating within the um, environment he is, after all. Yes, yes. So let's not leave Richard there. Let's, what did happen to the skeleton after the identification? Where is he resting now? So the plan was always, if Richard III was discovered and successfully identified, he'd be reburied in Leicester Cathedral. Mm. So Leicester Cathedral it is a modern designation. Um, it only became a cathedral in 1927, but that tends to get people forgetting that it is a medieval church. It was in existence when Richard III was alive. So it, it was a parish church rather than a cathedral church. And actually, it's less than 100 metres from where he was originally buried. So it always felt. Um, and this, from an archaeological point of view, this was following best archaeological practice. Um, that is to rebury, if you are going to rebury human remains, you rebury them as close to where they were originally found as you possibly can. And usually that tends to be a cemetery on the edge of town or something, because that's the nearest you can sort of legally right. get them. But in this instance, we had that ability to actually rebury him in the church a medieval church right next door so it always made the most sense but of course other people disagreed with that so there was a bit of a delay so we'd announced we'd discovered him in 2013 we were hoping to rebury him in 2014 but a judicial review uh, about it delayed everything until he was eventually reburied in Leicester Cathedral in a big ceremony of reburial in 2015 so actually we're just about to celebrate the 10th anniversary of that next year My thanks to Matthew for taking the time to talk to us. For more information about the Richard III dig, you should go to the University of Leicester's webpage where there is a large amount of information, pictures and articles about the project and it's all free to browse through. And if you ever visit Leicester, there's a visitor's centre telling the Richard III story next to the cathedral where, of course, you can also see the tomb where he has now, finally, been laid to rest. Next time I'll be looking at Shakespeare's version of the Richard III story, taking him from scheming against his brothers, through to the possession of the crown, and then his final end on Bosworth Field. In the meantime, please join the Facebook page or group, or find the podcast on Instagram or X to keep up to date with new episodes and other theatre-related things. If you do feel able to help out with the costs of running the podcast, then please head over to Patreon, where you will find additional content for a small monthly fee or a one-off donation. You can find details of ways to support the podcast at the New Look website, which is www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com, or via X at THOETP. Mm-hmm.